What's up gamers? Welcome back to another video, another rejected video on the A Shiny Sylveon channel. It's been a while since I've uploaded one of these. Uh, what these used to be were projects of mine that never really saw the light of day, but I still kind of wanted to revisit them. And in today's video, I'm going to be talking about competitive Rainbow Six Siege. This is a subject that I'm very passionate about for a multitude of reasons. I've talked to my friends a lot about it. I've even talked on stream about it um, to some extents. And basically what it had come down to was my frustrations with the current competitive format in Rainbow Six Siege and how that seem to be reflected on the recent appointment of the current tournament organizer blast and whether that was a fault of blast or ubisoft i tried to give credence either way but i basically pointed out this is unacceptable this is terrible this is how it used to be why can't you know we always were improving previously why can't we continue try to improve because this is the first time in a while that i can say that rainbow six really hasn't improved but the reason why this video is rejected isn't because I'm not going to revisit it, but rather because I the information that I share in this video has either been updated or it has not really, it's either not gone anywhere, it has been updated, and some of the teams and things that I've referenced are definitely a lot more uh, pertinent to a September release date. I was expecting to have the Dog of Ramen video out before, and but I went on vacation during the summer, went to visit my family and everything, and so that derailed a lot of my plans, and then I started university, or started college and everything, and so that's been a bit of a transitional period of just trying to get all my stuff packed together, and here we are now with the video here being slightly outdated, and so I want to come back and revisit this, update some information, and release this on a time frame that I feel a little bit more comfortable with. So that's the reason why we're here. Hope you all enjoy what I have to say. And uh, yeah, enjoy the commentary. It's just audio, by the way. So yeah, not much going on there. All right, bye. The title of this video might be a bit of an overstatement, and that's entirely because the information contained within is based upon observations that I've made surrounding the professional Rainbow Six Siege circuit and the perceived impact that its newest organizer, Blast, has had on it. And for full clarity, I'm not employed by Blast or Ubisoft, and all that I have to say here is based on a fan's perception. And since I'm not employed by any of the organizations within, I don't actually know what's going on, and a lot of what I have to say is a reductive series of questions and critiques I have as an outside spectator. And despite the ire that I might display, these are merely frustrations of my own that I do not know how to display outside of spelling them out in an essay format. I do not intend for this video to be inflammatory, and I openly discourage the harassment of anyone currently working for Ubisoft or Blast. The point of this video is to inform and entertain, and since I know most of my audience is composed of people who know very little of professional R6, I will be taking a lot of time to explain everything leading up to this point and why it has me so upset. And sources for any clips or posts that I use will be linked in the description below. Professional Rainbow Six Siege had its first official season in 2016, meaning that the scene is now seven years old. This was originally organized by ESL and Ubisoft, and if I'm being completely honest, I don't know if either organization knew what they wanted Rainbow Six to look like at the time. The game still looked like this, and ESL's caster desk was poorly lit, and it honestly reminded me pretty heavily of CSGO caster desks. Back then, there wasn't really an analyst or host desk, but it just goes to show that every esport has to start somewhere. Pro League's first year was divided into three seasons, with only North America and Europe representing. Both regions had a PC and Xbox One division at the time, and here's a list of the pros who played this game in the inaugural season that are still playing in Tier 1 to this day. This list was a lot longer a couple of months ago. Each season in the first year under ESL contained eight teams, lasted a month, and were book-ended by finals. Finals were one to two day events that pitted the two best teams of Europe against the two best teams of North America in a single elimination best of three bracket. After each finals, there were around six weeks worth of break from the regular season, and then they did it all over again. That is, until the end of the year where November marked the last finals of the year, and then competition would pick back up in March of the following year. Year 1, despite its rocky start, was successful enough that Year 2 saw the addition of Latin America as a region, followed by the introduction of Asia Pacific, APAC for short, in Season 3. 
APAC, due to its geographic disparity, was split into four miniature regions that then sent its best teams to an APAC tournament to determine which two of those would then be admitted to Pro League Finals. It was basically the same system as we had seen before, just with more regions and teams being added gradually. Year 2 had the first six Invitational, where the best teams from NA and EU were invited to the event, while all of the regions were required to go through a qualifier driving this tournament's number of teams up to six from an initial four. That's not all though. Rainbow Six was really starting to take off now, and this was best showcased by Year 3, 2018. ESL dropped the Year X Season X format and instead called the first season of Year 3 Season 7 and counted upwards from there. This year also introduced major tournaments which were like finals, but because of the ever-expanding roster of regions and teams, they were even more inclusive and more of a celebration of a team's half-year of achievements. Then, in February, following the year-end finals, Ubisoft hosted the Six Invitational, which were just majors, but even bigger, and considered a celebration of a whole year of achievements instead of just half a year. Invitationals are like Valorant's Champions series or League of Legends Worlds competitions in terms of scale relative to the Rainbow Six Siege scene. And DreamHack even hosted a few tournaments of their own throughout the summer of 2018, plus one in the winter, making the scene even larger than ever before. This system continued to grow and expand until it was something more like this. The Pro League was split into Europe, North America, Latin America, and APAC, with APAC being divided into Japan, South Korea, Southeast Asia, and ANZ. The APAC teams still competed in the APAC final to then play in season finals with the other first place teams from other regions. There were still majors and invitations being held, and DreamHack was still holding regular tournaments the R6 teams were invited to attend. By the year 2019, there was Siege to be seen basically year-round, and this doesn't even include Challenger League. Now, Challenger League was a second tier to Pro League that was introduced in year two, where the top two teams from Challenger League in each season would face against the lowest two teams from their Pro League counterpart in a small single elimination bracket. Whichever teams won the elimination bracket would then get spots in Pro League for the following season, and the losing teams would get relegated to Challenger League. Within the Challenger League itself, only the third and fourth place teams were guaranteed continued spots in Challenger League, along with those two others that had gone through the promotion series. The rest of them were wiped out and forced to play qualifiers to regain those spots. So from my own perspective, while this format was jam-packed with Rainbow Six events left, right, and center, there were two inherent issues with it. For one, teams never got a break. Even in the six weeks or so between seasons and majors, teams would have to use that supposed rest time to keep scrimming and grinding out strategies for the next event. For two, organizations that were trying to break into the scene had no guarantee of stability. Yes, Luminosity could hypothetically pick up a roster and run them through Challenger League and up to Pro League, and heck, the open qualifiers themselves guaranteed that just about anyone could make it to Pro League in the space of a few months, given that they could win qualifiers, Challenger League, and then get into Pro League itself. However, if that team underperformed for a season, then it was down to a league with a third of the prize pool, a fraction of the coverage, and zero chance of qualifying for international events. That is, unless they managed to qualify back for Pro League again. If their team re-qualified for Pro League on an off-season, though, they could miss the major for not being at the previous finals, then miss finals because they didn't do well enough in their second season of Pro League. ESL continued to organize competitive Rainbow Six Siege until the year of Armageddon 2020. Their last event was the Six Masters Tournament, which was a major qualifying tournament for Oceanic teams that was concluded on the 5th of July 2020. But in June of the same year, and yes, I am getting the months right, Faceit took over as the official tournament organizer. Now, Faceit adopted a fairly similar system to whatever stitched together amalgamation ESL was growing at the time, but made everything a little bit clearer. APAC was now no longer divided into four major regional divisions, but instead only two, South and North. Latin America was expanded to include Brazil, Mexico, and the rest of South America, while Brazil was the main scene that received English coverage. Mexico and the rest of South America were considered more minor regions, and their top teams would compete in a major qualifying tournament, the Copa Elite Six, against Brazilian teams to see which team got to represent the region at the major. 
North America did this weird thing for a brief period of time where they tried to divide it into the United States and Canada, but there are 30 people in Canada and maybe two of them know how to play Rainbow Six Siege. So after a while, they decided that a North American league would do just fine and Mirage was invited to it, but not Nordic. Europe remained as Europe as far as I can tell. No need to change the best continent, am I right, fellas? But one of the larger changes that came about was a bit more under the surface, and that was the change made to Challenger League. Now instead of teams being rotated in and out of Tier 1 of Rainbow Six Siege basically every other month, teams were only promoted and relegated once a year based on their performances in the final stage of the year. This fixed the stability issue that was present before, but introduced a couple of others. If the final season or stage of the year was the only one that counted towards promotion and relegation, then why would teams in Challenger League or teams wanting to use the Challenger League system to promote to Pro League care about any other stage? I'm of course speaking logistically, I'm not doubting the fact that some of these players might have played in Challenger League because they enjoyed playing Rainbow Six Siege in a competitive level that wasn't the ranked playlist. If I were to make any sort of guess though, it would have been that Challenger League also had a relegation and qualification system of its own at the end of each individual stage that allowed new teams to shuffle in. These new teams then had to face more established Challenger League teams, but even then, those previously established ones were constantly changing rosters and team names, so whatever semblance of consistency it was supposed to have never really stuck around. And as much as I hate to say it because I enjoyed watching it, Challenger League was treated like it was never supposed to be something that was set up for organizational longevity. In the first stage of 2021, there were some small-scale esports orgs, such as Livid Gaming, Parabellum Esports, Honor Esports, and Kansas City Pioneers that found their footing in Challenger League, but they were also among teams that I would simply refer to now as collections of OK players, including current or ex-pro players. X Nordic contained Jarvis and DP Fire, Supernova had Marmalade, Ape had Callout, Forest, and Melted at this time. But then in Stage 2, these teams and rosters got swapped around so much that they were basically unrecognizable. Ape was acquired by the Wichita Wolves, Slaughterhouse renamed themselves to Late Registration, X Nordic disbanded, and Storms, who played for them previously, was picked up by a team called Lenny GG. Pambazoo also got poached from Livid Gaming by Dark Zero around this time. I mean, like, look, the whole thing was a mess, but it was a consistent one. In some ways, I can criticize Challenger League for not being organized, but to be honest, that's not what Rainbow Six Esports had become at this level. R6 at this second tier level had become more of a game to see which players stuck around, whose legacy I could follow, and thankfully there were actually a few teams that were consistent enough to keep an eye on. In other words, Challenger League had become a consistent pool of semi-professional players that one could follow just as easily because of how their competitions were just as day in and day out as pro leagues were. And now you might be wondering why I'm talking more about the face it side of things compared to ESL. And that's because in 2019 I started watching Pro League and saw the glory days of Mint and BC on Dark Zero. It wasn't until 2020 that I felt wholly invested in it. I was following whole teams, casters, and I felt like I understood everything about the top tier of R6 as a general viewer. So when it was suddenly announced at the end of 2022 that Faceit would no longer be organizing professional Rainbow Six and that duty was going to be handed over to another TO called Blast, I was ecstatic, actually. With the introduction of Blast came the introduction of another regional restructuring. North America, Brazil, and Europe, those regions remained the same, but South America and Mexico were re-merged into LATAM. Meanwhile, APAC South and North were split back into several pieces with dedicated leagues for Japan, South Korea, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Oceania. O Oceania, Oce Oceania. And finally, to tie it all off, the new region which had been a self-contained competitive scene for a while at this point, Middle East and North Africa, or MENA for short, was introduced. In the space of a couple of months, Professional Rainbow Six had doubled its count of Tier 1 competitive regions. I was initially very excited for this, because it meant that a lot of the smaller teams that could offer genuine competition were no longer being held back by weird scheduling times or having to battle with ping issues. Countries like Pakistan, India, Saudi Arabia, and Bangladesh were being given proper space to test their mettle at a properly organized and broadcasted high tier of play. More competition in my mind has always been a good thing because it lights a fire under the asses of teams who didn't have the opportunity to deal with fresh teams, equally as hungry to prove themselves. 
It's also the reason why I think that relegation and promotion systems are healthy for leagues because it gives player at a lower tier the chance to prove that they deserve to be considered professional players. It keeps the scene fresh. Parabellum's first Pro League squad, carried by Kool-Aid, Eska, Penguin, Spirits, and Sonar, we don't talk about Luis, is proof of this theory being put into practice. But the more that I dwelled on it, and by that I mean in less than 24 hours, the more that this new structure started to worry about me. Yes, there were double the regions now, but in doing so, Blast completely eliminated Challenger League. Well, almost completely. Instead of having a second tier of play that had regular seasons topped off by a year-end relegation playoff, Blast introduced the idea of last chance qualifier tournaments, tournaments whose sole winner would be allowed to compete in the major for that stage. In North America, these LCQs are tournaments that quite literally any team can enter. These tournaments start with phase one that splits into two parts, the winners of which will go to phase two. In Phase 2, the number of teams will be whittled down even further, and the winners of Phase 2 will go to a Qualifier Playoffs. In the Qualifier Playoffs, the winners of Phase 2 will face the lowest three teams from the North American League for that stage. Then after that, they will hit the final Last Chance Qualifier Tournament, which adds the 4th and 5th place teams from North American League to the tournament. Whoever is the sole winner of this final phase will then qualify for the Major directly, and here's the problem with that. These tournaments are two-day events with single elimination brackets. If your team had one bad day, that was it. Pack it up, go home, and wait another six months until the next tournament comes around. Second of all, none of these tournaments had any monetary value attached to them, so teams that might have been genuinely competitive at a Tier 2 level could not get properly compensated for their efforts. Without proper compensation, non-professional players are not able to make playing R6 their job, yet when they get to the final phase of LCQ, they are expected to compete at the same level as people who are full-time R6 players. This isn't bad per se, because you want your major tournaments to be representative of your best teams in each respective region, but if your best teams end up being teams that aren't paid to play full time though, that can reflect rather poorly on the quality of the tier 1 league, and possibly degrade majors even further. Like I said earlier, if a team ends up having a bad day and they bottom out in any of these tournaments, that could be curtains for them, and that includes tier 1 teams. The argument here is that tier 2 teams now have a direct route that they can take to the major unlike what they had before without sacrificing the stability of tier 1 play. If a tier 2 team ends up beating out other tier 1 teams, they should be the ones represented at the major because they were clearly better. I don't agree with that sentiment though, because a team can have an incredible season run and then lose to a random qualifier. Additionally, if these teams aren't given consistent playing opportunities and have to throw themselves at unrelated tournaments throughout the year to keep up a competitive edge, then there's no semblance of stability. The tier 2 scene does not appear to have any consistency now, and therefore cannot be expected to be representative of the best of Siege. Last Chance Qualifiers, known as LCQs for short, make it so that lower rated North American League teams have a shot at getting into the Major if their stage doesn't go well. On the other side of the pond though, in Southeast Asia and South Asia, Last Chance Qualifiers are the only way that these teams from those regions are allowed to qualify. Most infamously, the Southeast Asian team Bleed Esports went 7-0 and zero in their league. Their closest match was a 7-4 victory over Taiwanese team Dire Wolves. Across 7 games, they only dropped a total of 14 rounds. But because Bleed Esports is a team from Southeast Asia, they were subjected to playing in last chance qualifiers against their own region teams and teams from the South Asia League, and Bleed didn't end up making it. Instead, the teams from these two regions that were allowed to represent the regions were SEA second place rep Elevate, who finished the stage with 17 points out of 21, a pretty respectable amount, and fifth place SEA rep Fury. Fury won less than half. They won three out of seven games in the stage, but because they were able to win the last chance qualifiers to the major, it did not matter how they played out over the course of the regular season. Elevate and Fury were both knocked out of the Major on day one. It really makes me wonder how much more competitive it would have been if Bleed were guaranteed their spot, but that's a question that we'll never know the answer to. 
APAC has historically always done terribly at international events. I chalk it up to the lack of ability to scrim with teams that have diverse international experience, seeing as the ping delay between APAC and other regions is pretty significant. Now, would you believe me if I told you that APAC collectively took up over a third of the major competition? Majors nowadays take on 24 teams, three of which are from Japan, three from South Korea, two from Asia, those LCQ tournaments I talked about a minute ago, and one guaranteed from Australia. Nine of the 24 teams are from the competitive region that has always performed the worst at any international competition. Japan and South Korea even had the benefit of their first place teams getting a bye into the second phase of the tournament, a large Swiss style bracket. This meant that these two teams were allowed to bypass the double elimination bracket at the start of the tournament. So with those two teams exempt, let's go through results of the other seven now, shall we? Sandbox and Fury managed to pair up against each other in the first double elimination bracket, which Sandbox won seven to five. Fury went home first, making a valiant effort that held EU team m and to an 8-6 overtime map. Sandbox fell to Falcons in the upper bracket and then m and in the lower bracket, taking home only 10 total rounds in the last three maps that they played. Elevate crashed and burned in Group B, gathering only 12 rounds in three maps. La Vega Esports did the worst out of any APAC team, representing as they bowed out at six rounds in three maps. Two rounds per map average. And one of their matchups in the lower bracket was against another APAC team, North Epshin. But North Epshin was the next victim, losing 2-1 against Rev and E Club. Bliss got thrashed 7-1 by W7M and then took a 2-1 map loss to Japanese team Varel, who went on to only take 6 rounds in their 2 maps against Wolves. There were 7 APAC teams in the play-in phase, and zero of them qualified for the Swiss phase. That is abysmal, to say the least. Again, I wonder what would have happened if Bleed Esports was guaranteed their spot, and if Challenger League wasn't bastardized for the sake of these stupid qualifier tournaments that have only served to degrade the achievements of those competing at Tier 1. Instead of BDS, Oxygen, and Loss 1, we had Varel, La Vega, and North Epshin. I'm happy for them to compete because it gives them more exposure internationally, sure, but when the results at the Major are this predictable from day one, it really makes you wonder how much more interesting it would have been if objectively better teams weren't screwed over by their horrendous league system. Blast seems to have an addiction to putting teams through elimination brackets, and even their regular stages aren't immune to this practice. In North America's first stage of 2023, eight teams competed against each other over a period of three weeks. And instead of letting this regular competitive period determine who was allowed to go to the major though, the stage ended by taking the top six teams and putting them through a best of three double elimination bracket. Sonics finished third in the league overall, but they got relegated to going through the last chance qualifiers playoffs and knocked out a bunch of other teams that might have had a greater chance to qualify for the major if Sonics weren't there. And as much as I love the players from M80, they finished sixth place in the league. They gained 10 of 21 possible points, but because they got their act together during the playoff bracket, they took first place in the stage and were given a bye to the second phase of the Copenhagen Major. This is further proof that placement genuinely does not matter during the stage, the regular play that is meant to prove a team's overall performance and stability. If a team can win some elimination brackets at the end of the stage, then who cares about where they place in the regular stage as long as it's not dead last. The North American League structure makes little sense, but every other larger league structure makes even less sense. I don't know if this was done to cram as many games into as short of a time as possible, but Japan, South Korea, Brazil, LATAM, and Europe have divided their regions teams into two round-robin groups with only elimination brackets to determine the region's winner. North America has nine teams for the second stage and they're not divided into groups. Europe has 10, Brazil has 10, South Korea, Japan, and LATAM have eight, and those regions are divided. Problem number one, some of these teams will never get the opportunity to face each other in the regular season now, a real chance to prove their mettle against every single team in their region. They are not being given the opportunity to prove themselves consistent against every facet of their respective leagues. 
Problem number two, this grouping system also guarantees that teams that have proven themselves to be competitive in the past will be inexcusably eliminated from contention. Right now in Europe, Group B is comprised of G2 Esports, Heroic, Eminem Gaming, BDS, and Wolves Esports. G2 won the 6th Invitational this year in February. Eminem fought tooth and nail to narrowly lose in the quarterfinals to W7M in Copenhagen. BDS won the Major in Yonchiping and the Gamers 8 tournament this summer. Wolves was one of the most dominant teams in 2022. Heroic is the only one that hasn't been showing up all that recently, but I can't deny that they are still a competitive team. And yet, two teams out of this group will be guaranteed to not go to the major, while the team that scrapes by on the results in the group could end up being crowned first place in the stage because they can win a double elimination bracket. This system is disjointed, asinine, and unfair. It gives too much credence to freak results and doesn't do well to showcase the team's overall ability compared to the rest of their region. It is genuinely frustrating as a fan of competitive Rainbow Six. But hey, what do I know? These are just observations that I have made as a viewer. I'm sure that the experience of coaches and players have been far more fulfilling than I've made it out to be. I'm also certain that some players might be over the moon with the idea that they can indeed play in LCQ tournaments. Maybe elimination brackets are better than a season-long round robin. I truly don't understand this game at their level, and I don't want anyone to believe that I have some truly divine insight into it. What has been a major source of frustration is how damned long it's taken for Tier 1 to kick back up again. Stage 1 of this year started in March, the Major ended in April, and then Stage 2 started in September. I'm all for giving pros and commentators the breaks that they need, but five whole months without a peep, without a, a smidgen of Tier 1 play is excessive. Sponsors don't want to pay teams that aren't going to be showing off their merchandise or branding due to a lack of broadcasts. A lack of sponsors leads into a lack of funding for paying the players the salaries that they're owed. A lack of salary for a player means that the player simply cannot continue to play Rainbow Six Siege professionally because it comes at a massive financial loss. Several great players over the last few months have simply given up on Rainbow Six Siege because they see greater opportunities for themselves out there somewhere. While I'm extremely happy for whatever career path they take, it leaves a sour taste in my mouth to know that this was a decision that they made out of necessity. Most pressing news as of late is that this stage is EU Team Heroic's last stage as an organization, stating that it has been proven difficult to run a healthy team with the current environment. This rapid withdrawal of individuals and even organizations from the professional scene doesn't just stop with those playing the game, either. Here are some statements from casters and analysts who are now finding themselves formerly employed by Blast and Ubisoft. Desk host Eric Doa Lundquist was probably one of my favorite hosts of R6, as his inviting demeanor helped calmly navigate the chaos that was Rainbow Six Siege. He felt very much like the dad of the host desk. <laughs> Now's as good as time as any to say that I won't be returning to Rainbow Six Esports. My agent was told that they wanted to go in a new creative direction for NAL with someone more bubbly. I'll try to improve my bubbliness for future esports opportunities. GG's R6, it was fun. I mean, I laughed when I saw the bubbly part, it's genuinely funny. But by sheer coincidence, I've noticed that the people across regions that were critical internally of how Blast are running things are the same people not being brought back. Purely coincidental, though, I'm sure. CJ Cookies Brooks was one of those brought up to commentate on one of the new regions from what used to be Challenger League and was led to believe that he was going to continue working for Blast for the foreseeable future. It seems I have been canned from the R6 NAL after two weeks of work, after six years of dedication, including three as a CL talent to get there. In this four month off season, I was never warned or told. I learned from rumors, silent treatment, and Twitter. I was not allowed to work any other regional leagues for work or exposure because I was doing the NAL in Stage 1, but now I sit with no job, with no warning, with no opportunities in Stage 2, regional or otherwise, while making peanuts for the year because I only did those two weeks. John Blue Mullen is one of the long-standing greats of North American League casting as his professionalism and enthusiasm helped make Rainbow Six Siege feel larger than life. And here he is responding to Cookie's tweet. Similar experience, unfortunately. Incredibly frustrating, the lack of any explanation after a five-year relationship, in my case, has left a horrible taste in my mouth. 
sadly, it's just better to move on. we will get no justice from a Twitter crusade as shit as it is to say this. Life update, and I won't lie, searching for commentary gigs right now, I was coming up completely empty. Just seems like there's very little appetite for an experienced, and again, being honest, more expensive, commentator to be given a shot in another game right now. With that being said, I started looking outside of esports for employment about two weeks ago, and I've already located something promising. Going to be giving this new direction a try. Thanks, man. I wish I could have had an opportunity to really pop off. It's unfortunate to see the blatant mistakes being made by Blast and Ubisoft specifically this year. Not my product, however, so it's out of my hands. These people have done nothing wrong in raising concerns with their employers because they want to be excited for a competitive system that makes sense. What I find atrocious, though, is that Blast and Ubisoft have collectively done nothing about the esports organizations known as Parabellum and Mirage. Their crimes? They don't pay their players. In late 2022, Mirage was under heavy fire from multiple pros for not paying their players what they were owed. In February of 2023, they dropped their entire roster, then signed on a new one with this statement attached a month later. I won't read the whole thing, but it basically says, eh, yeah, sorry about not paying any of these talented individuals. <laughs> Our bad. They are still competing at this stage. Hyper, who played for Mirage briefly at the end of 2022, claimed in June of this year that he still hasn't been paid by Mirage. This pattern, combined with the fact that Yeti, whose last team was Mirage, retired from the scene, makes me wonder if any of the players nowadays are getting paid by this organization. Parabellum also fell into a same pattern as Laxing made a rather extensive tweet detailing his horrible experience with the parent company and how Parabellum allegedly owes him $13,000. Thankfully, the team was able to disband from Parabellum and find opportunities elsewhere if they didn't retire from the scene, meaning that Parabellum is no more. It's still rather depressing, though, that the team had climbed through the competitive ladder as was intended to get themselves into Pro League just for them to fire the entire original roster, hire a new one, not compensate them properly, and then disband during Blast's reign of silence. That much was a player-led decision, though, and in the case of some of these players from Mirage, they don't have other options right now. That's all that I know from North America, at least. This might be repeated in other regions, but I generally only speak English, so the information that I have is based on what I know and what I could find. Since Blast's sudden takeover in 2023, we have seen an unprecedented number of departures from the Rainbow Six professional scene, and I'm not talking about just players or organizations. Sure, we've had some hosts rotate out in the last few years, but accepting the tragic loss of Kickstarter in 2021 and Stoke stepping away earlier this year for his wedding, casters have largely remained the same. They are the voices of the competitive scene, and suddenly losing any of them is a massive shock to the community. Losing them because Blast or Ubisoft or both organizations didn't like their critiques is insulting. I'm singling out Blast because their appointment was right around where all these problems started to come to a head, but however, if I'm to give them the benefit of the doubt, I believe it's not solely Blast making poor decisions, but Ubisoft as well. The reason why I'm including Ubisoft in any of this is because I don't know who holds more sway over the comp scene nowadays. Blast was founded in 2016, so perhaps as a newer tournament organizer, they were okay with letting Ubisoft call more of the shots. Perhaps Blast also wasn't aware about what scope Rainbow Six operate at, and neither did Ubisoft, but they wanted to make changes for the sake of making changes. Doing that, making changes because they wanted to make changes, is something that Ubisoft has done a lot recently, where they will not listen to the community and implemented unwanted things. Their most recent expansion, Operation Heavy Metal, is very indicative of this. They changed the matchmaking systems to make them objectively worse, they buffed shotguns to an unbelievable degree, and they reworked one of the staple operators to be less unfair to play against. Yes, the point of Frost was to snap the shins of people who weren't watching and required the use of utility in three very, very specific locations. Why would you change this? So what do we do about this? Ideally, after this year runs its course, Blast and Ubisoft have a long, hard look at the system that they have now bastardized and just go back to what Face It was doing before. This system was fine. <laughs> Include the new regions how you can, of course, but at least stop with these elimination bracket playoffs everywhere. This is awful. Also, bring back Challenger League. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Bye-bye.